<laughs> Take your Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 21. Amen. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for the season. Uh, thank you for getting us all here safely. Uh, Lord, I just pray you'd bless us today, Father. And uh, Lord, help us never forget what the season's all about. And Lord, the people in this world that need to hear the gospel, uh, let us never forget that there's someone out there that needs to hear it. And there's going to be somebody until you take us out of here, Lord. Uh, thank you for a Bible that we can hold in our hands. Lord, there's just so much stuff that we need to be thankful for. Help us never forget. And we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Genesis 21, Abraham. Abraham, man, he is a friend of God. Let me get there. Abraham has got some issues that he has to deal with, just like all of us. Uh, I heard a preacher once say, uh, if he goes, uh, you, if you quit, you can quit if you want to, uh, or you can go on but it's going to hurt either way. Uh, there's no matter. Life is one of those things that you just have to deal with. Uh, there's just nothing you can get out of it. Life is just life. Life has always been life, always will be life, and you just have to go through life. Life is just one of those things. So many people think that life is just an easy thing, but when you start looking through the Bible and you start looking at the characters all the way through our Bible, what you find out is that each and every one of them had to make decisions. Each and every one of them had to uh, uh, live with the decisions they made, and sometimes they just messed up. I mean, they just, they just flat messed up just like the rest of us do. And when you get to that place where you realize that, hey, uh, people do mess up, it's a lot easier to realize that you do too. And if you stop and think about it for just a second or two, uh, it would be a lot easier on you and everybody else if you just forgave those that mess up and let's, let's move on. Uh, it, it just happens in life. Uh, verse 11, Genesis 21, 11. Abraham is, uh, the Lord's getting ready to tell Abraham something. He says, and uh, actually, go back to verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, uh, the Egyptian, which uh, she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the, uh, the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Uh, the, and the thing was very grievous to Abraham in, the, in uh, Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let, let it not be grievous in thy sight, because of the lad and because of, of the bondwoman, in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And, and also of the son of the bondwoman, I will make a nation because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early, rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, uh, putting it on her shoulder uh, and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Father, again, thank you for your blessings. Bless the message this morning. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Abraham, Abraham has got to deal with some issues that uh, he shouldn't have had to deal with. And uh, we get ourselves, I'm telling you, my brother, sometimes we get ourselves into positions uh, because we don't think. Uh, in the moment, sometimes things sound good. Uh, but in reality, the best thing to do sometimes is don't do it. It's going to hurt either way you look at it. Uh, you're going to be miserable by yourself or you're going to be miserable with somebody else. And in the end, if the thing's not right, uh, you're going to have to come back and pay for that thing. I like that message, payday someday. It always comes back. Hagar was probably a good wife to Abraham. Probably was. Abraham loved her. Uh, he never says anywhere in there that he had an issue with her. Uh, Sarah had a couple issues with her, but Abraham never had an issue with her. Uh, she probably did everything she was supposed to do. Uh, however, he told uh, Adam and Eve back there, he goes, you're going to be the husband of one wife. You leave your father and mother and, and cleave to one another. So all the way through there, they're supposed to have one wife, one husband. Uh, when Sarah gave Abraham Hagar, he should have declined that. But for whatever reason, he didn't. Uh, and he thought that, hey, I can have a kid through her, and, and, and maybe that's how God's going to do it. Sometimes we, we sit there and say, well, God, if God said he's going to do it, Believe me, you don't have to inject one iota of uh, energy into that. He will do it. And he will do it exactly like he said do it. What we do is we try to figure out. Sometimes the Lord waits and says, are you going to wait for me? Be still and know that I am God. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. Are you going to wait? Uh, if he said he's going to do something, guess what? He'll do it. So we jump into it. And then we get into it and we're thinking, Lord, how come it didn't work out that way? Because that's not the way I was going. You went the wrong way. Uh, I was going this way, you went that way. I was going to let you get this, and you got that. Uh, Sarah, Sarah should have never opened her mouth, and she did. Ishmael had only had, uh, Ishmael has been Abraham's son for about 13, 14 years at this point, and he has grown an attachment for this young man. It's his son. 
Uh, it may not be Sarah's son, but it is Abraham's son. Now, all of a sudden, uh, broken marriages in our country are, are rampant today, and it's just a mess. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob had lots of problems. He had four, four wives. He had uh, Rachel and Leah and then two handmaids and all the kids between that thing. And next thing you know, Joseph's getting thrown in the pit. And I mean, there's just so much stuff that happens in, in marriages. It's hard enough to keep a marriage together when it's just a husband and wife and you struggle to keep that thing together. But you start putting uh, broken marriages with children on both sides of that thing, uh, it, it gets rough. It just gets rough. Genesis 15.1. Go back to Genesis 15.1 real quick. Lord promised Abraham something back there. Abraham just got ahead of the game. I think we do that quite, quite frequently. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Verse 2. Uh, and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house, this Eliezer of Damascus, uh, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. And, and Abraham's sitting there in his mind thinking, well, I don't have anybody of me. Uh, Sarah can't have a child. She, she's not going to have a child, or she's not up to this point. Uh, chances are she's probably not. And now all of a sudden the opportunity came over for Hagar and, and he goes, it will be my seed and there's my child. And that's, that's just not the way that the Lord said do it. And, and verse 4 there in uh, 15 says, and behold, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this shall not be thine heir, uh, but he, Eliezer is not going to be, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Eliezer wasn't going to be it, but uh, Ishmael was out of his bowels. Ishmael was of his seed. Ishmael fit the bill of what God just said there, but that's not what God said, and that's not what God was looking for. God brought Abraham and Sarah out of Ur of the Chaldees, brought them through everything, and Sarah was going to be the mother of that child. Not only that, it was going to be something that when it happened, it was going to be uh, something that could be written in a book that could be talked about for a, here's a woman at 90 years old having a baby. Uh, that's, that's quite amazing, man. You get women that have babies at 20 anymore, they don't ever want another one. Uh, then they have one after that. After a couple of them, I guess they just don't care no more. Uh, but some of them, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, I think those ladies are crazy. Uh, three or four is plenty. Uh, five or six is okay. But, man, mu much more than that, uh, I think you're, you're, well, that's just my, my opinion. Women can do whatever they want. Verse 12, uh, Genesis 19, 12. <laughs> I better shut up, man. I'm going to get myself in trouble here in a few minutes. <laughs> and God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous uh, in thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in uh, Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, Sarah told him to take Hagar. Now Sarah is telling him to get rid of her. And uh, you got to stop sometimes and say, okay, when should I hearken unto my wife? Ladies, I'm not upset with you guys at all. I think you all the greatest thing since peanut butter. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my mom. But, I mean, men, what you're going to have to learn to do is you got to step up to the plate and make the decision. The decision falls on the man, not the woman. The woman can put in a 10,000. Now, here you go. That's not what society says today. I got that. I don't care what society says. They say transgender is okay, too. Uh, you know what happened? They say transvestites are okay. Uh, the LGBTQRT, ABCDEFG, they're okay, too. Uh, all this stuff, is just because society says something, it's okay to teach your kids about sex education in the first grade. No, it's not. I got a mother-in-law, that ex, um, uh, stepmother-in-law, I don't know what she is, but she was in the school system for 100 billion years. And she thinks it's perfectly fine. To, she was against Beth for homeschooling. I was against Beth for homeschooling. Uh, I mean, it just takes so much time of a lady's life to homeschool. That's a lot of work. Uh, and ladies that can do it, I mean, it's it just a lot of work to do it. So we put them in a Christian school, which is probably just almost as bad as sometimes as a public school. But, but they survived through that thing, and, and here they are out there today. Uh, she was, uh, she, oh, she hated my guts because we put our kids in something other than a public school. I'm like, a public school will ruin them, definitely. You guarantee it will ruin them. Unless parents put a lot of effort into their kids, a public school system will ruin them. Now, you can get them through public school. I'm not saying you can't. 
And we probably yanked them all out of public school when we should have got involved and maybe made the school exactly what it should be. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's a lot of work. He said, let it not be grievous. That's your son. That's his son. And he says, listen to your wife. How do you, what do you, when do you listen? Well, I got a little note here that says, the key here is to make the decision based on a spiritual, not a carnal choice. Hey, Abraham chose Hagar on a carnal choice. He made a carnal choice in choosing her. Uh, Hagar, or Sarah said, oh, here, take my handmaid. Well, he's looking for a son, and Sarah ain't going to give me a son, and God said I'm going to have a son, so maybe this is the way he's going. And it was a carnal choice that he did that. Uh, he should have went back to the Lord and said, hey, is this the way you're going to do that? And let's let the Lord answer. Never did ask. There's no question there where he ever asked that. Uh, it needs to be based on uh, spiritual, not carnal. So we can take input all over the place and from everybody, but in the end of that thing, remember that you are going to be the one to answer to God for the decision you make, period. Ladies, when you push your husband to do something, just remember if it goes wrong, he's going to get nailed for it. So I guess in that case, it's you can do whatever you want. But if you're tied to him, uh, you're going to get nailed to that thing too, and it's just not a good thing. Uh, here the Lord told Abraham uh, what to do. Uh, concerning Hagar, clearly he told him. He said, let her go, put her in the wilderness, I'll take care of her. Uh, he says that in the next verse as we go on through. Uh, Matthew 19, 7, 7 is, uh, uh, he's talking to Moses, and they're sitting there talking back and forth, and, and the Lord sits there, and they ask him a bill of divorcement. He says, uh, they said unto him, why did Moses then give a uh, uh, command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Why, why did Moses, oh, we're under the law, we're doing the law, we're doing the law. Why did Moses say it's okay to have a divorce? Uh, Christ comes back, and he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, Suffer ye to put your, away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Uh, Solomon, First Sol, uh, Solomon, one, uh, First Kings eleven one, that's that's a verse you should never ever forget. Uh, a passage sitting there where Solomon it says, but Solomon, Solomon talked to the Lord twice. Uh, he had dreams with, and the Lord dealt with him two times, and Solomon still ends up making a mess out of things. Uh, where it says right here, First First Kings eleven one, but but King Solomon loved many strange women. Uh, together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Zidonians and the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto of the children of Israel, Ye shall not go, uh, not go into them, neither shall they, they come into you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. One's bad enough. One will definitely turn your heart away. Uh, Abraham has now got two. He's got Hagar and Sarah. And he's come to love Sarah, uh, Hagar and, and Ishmael just as much as he did Sarah uh, because it's just a natural thing for a man to do, or a woman, either one. Emotions run rampant in humans. I mean, it's part of our life. It's part of our structure. You can't really get away from the stuff. It's, it, that's why the Lord says don't do it. And, and I made that comment just before we started this thing that, that you can quit or you can go on. Uh, but either one's going to hurt. Uh, sometimes it's just going to hurt to go through life and not get something that you think you should have. Because you've got a Bible sitting in front of you and, and, and it just it says no. It says no. And I'm like, oh, but Lord, yeah, I want it. But it says no. I said, yeah, but it says no. And what you're going to have to do is say, okay, then knows the answer. Do you know if you get what you think you should want, it's going to probably hurt just as bad somewhere down the road anyways? So you might as well just hurt right now and get it over with and say, I'm done with it. And, and man up and take it, or lady up, whichever one it is. Uh, verse 13. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a great nation. Because he is thy seed. There's the danger. If the Lord puts a blessing on you, which he did Abraham, then that blessing is going to follow through to every seed that is of Abraham's. And when he told him what to do and he went beyond what he should have done, he created a whole other group of people called the Arabs out there right now that's causing issues that will always cause issues until the Lord comes back. And there's just nothing you can do about it. It's because Abraham did something he shouldn't have done. Uh, brother, that's a lesson for all of us. I mean, we should watch very carefully what we do. Uh, it's, it, just, it just doesn't affect us. It affects everybody around us. And so many times people don't care what they do to anybody around them anymore. Uh, they think that everybody, I guess we're in a entitlement nation where we think everybody's good. I was reading through Haggai. You ever read your Bible? 
You ought to read your Bible sometimes. It's really good. Haggai is right there with uh, Zechariah and Malachi. And Haggai, I think it was Haggai. It's either Haggai or the first part of uh, Zechariah. I'd have to go back and look real quick. But in any case, either one of those, I think it's Haggai. He's, I mean, he's slamming Israel. Uh, and the reason he's slamming is because they were in Babylon. Uh, you know, you know what the Jew makes the Jew love money? Because they went in captivity under Babylon for 70 years. And they've seen all the wealth of Babylon. And they realize how to get it. And now they get it and they love it. And they're like, oh, I can't let go of it. And they just have a knack for making money anyways. They have a knack for anything. But it's just they're blessed and they see that money, man. And Haggai says the wealth, the wealth got them. You know what's wrong with our nation today? The wealth will get us. We think just because everybody else has something, we should have it too. And, so, and, and you can't get away from it. On the way to church this morning, Beth said, well, if we could just get rid of the TV, you get rid of the TV and you got your cell phone. Get rid of the cell phone, you got billboards. Now they got electronic billboards, you might as well be watching TV as you're going down the street. I mean, you can't get away from it. There's no possible way you can get away from it. That thing inundates us 24-7. This is something, y'all are awful quiet, man. I'm, I'm learning to get rid of every stinking thing I got. Why? Because it does nothing but gets me in trouble. That's it. You know, people get mad at you for getting rid of your stuff. If you get stuff, they get mad at you because you got stuff. If you get rid of your stuff, they get mad at you because now you're making me look bad because you're getting rid of your stuff and I still got stuff. Uh, you can't win in America. You just can't win. And the Jews couldn't either. I, I was reading through there, and I, I started reading Schofield's notes on that thing. And I'm like, check that out, Lord. I said, that's exactly where we're at today. Uh, uh, I want, listened to, uh, what's that guy's name on the radio that does all the finance stuff? Dave Ramsey. Ramsey. Yeah, Dave Ramsey. It was hilarious. I, I drove all the way back. I mentioned, I think, Wednesday night. But he's, he was sitting there talking, and this Bitcoin stuff. And I had people call me and say, what do you think about the Bitcoin? I'm like, I don't know nothing about the Bitcoin, and I'm not going to find out anything about the Bitcoin. I'm too old for Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm too, I don't want to lose what I got, and what little I got, I got to keep so that if something happens to me, Beth take care of. And I'm sitting there going, why would I want to do that? And he's, he's rambling on about that thing. He goes, well, he said, everybody calls me an old fuddy-duddy because of this, and I won't get on the new stuff and this. He goes, and they say I'm this and I'm that. He goes, but I got a couple hundred million bucks, and they don't. <laughs> I started laughing at that. I said, now, that's pretty cool, man. I mean, I got a couple hundred million. I can get through Bitcoin. I don't need Bitcoin. And he goes, what I did is I earned it the old-fashioned way. I worked. He said, I lost it, and I worked and got it back. And he goes, I know how to keep it. He goes, what's wrong with us today is we think we got to have it right now, and you spend every dime you got to get it right now, and you're always broke. And I'm thinking, well, that's, you know, I don't listen to Ramsey that much, but, uh, Mr. Ramsey. I, I don't know if he's saved or he's lost. I, but, I mean, you know, I sit there, I had to listen to something for 23 hours, so I chose something to talk down through there. And when I listened, I said, that's right, right. If you work, guess what? You will eventually make money. If you don't work, you're going to look at somebody else to give you something. And when you get that, then you're going to take everything you can as fast as you can. And what's going to happen, you're going to end up like Abraham here, and you're going to make a mistake. And it's going to cost you. Abraham could get out of it, and he was taken care of enough to do it. And, and verse 13 Genesis 19, or 21, 13, and also of the son of the bondwoman. He said, I will make a great nation. Uh, I'll make a nation because he is thy seed. God blessed Abraham's seed in Genesis 15, 4, and he's going to continue to bless it all the way through. There's just no way out of it. Uh, and we couldn't, you couldn't bomb the, uh, the Arabs enough to solve that problem. Uh, if they would just read their Bible, all you had to do is give our military to the, the Jews. Let the Jews have it for a couple months, six months. They'll take care of all the problems in the Middle East. There won't be a problem over there. However, comma, we won't do it. And since we won't do it, we're going to have that problem until the Lord comes back. Uh, and he's not going to give men wisdom enough to do that because the Lord's in this thing. And you're going to see that right now. The best thing you could ever learn or I could ever learn is how to trust God. That's the best thing you'll ever learn in your life. If you can learn that little thing right there, how to trust the Lord with your life. Not with your stuff, with your life. Your stuff is secondary. He can get that with no problem. If you give him your life, he can do whatever he wants with it. And Abraham, verse 14. Abraham rose up early in the morning. So you know what the good lesson there is? Get out of bed and go to work. Amen. Don't stay in bed all day long. I call Mike every, every now and then. I'll call him six or 7 o'clock in the morning, 7.30, something like that, 8. They'll get you up. Now, he's done been up for like two days. Uh, he, he, I mean, he, he puts me to shame. I, I can't even go to, if I'm sitting there thinking I gotta, I'll got i set my alarm clock. Alarm clock's almost useless anymore. I can set it for 3 a.m. and I'm up at 
zing. Something in my head just says, get up. Uh, it's a waste to set the alarm clock, but I'm always afraid that one of these days, I don't have faith in my alarm clock. I don't have faith in me, but one of these days I'm going to oversleep. But he sits there and he says, and Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a bottle. He does what God says, even though it hurts. See, we don't like the pain. It's the, the hurt, the, the emotional stress. I mean, he's got to look Hagar in her face and, and kick her out. Uh, Sarah's calling him the bond woman and, and the bond child. The, the, you know, he's not even, uh, he's not even uh, Ishmael anymore. Kick her out and, and the bond woman. Kick her out and the son. Kick her son out with her. Uh, they're not even names to her anymore. But to Abraham, she's a real person. She's, she's his wife. And he has to kick her out because the Lord said it. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it to, unto Hagar, put it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Wandered around in circles. Now, the Lord told Abraham something, and Abraham did what he said. And he said, I'm going to make a great nation of him. I'm going to make a nation of him also. No compass, no GPS, no cell phone to get directions or to call for help. No texting. What in the world would you do with texting? Hey, brother, glad you're back, man. <laughs> How long are you in for? Uh, ten days. Ten days. Uh, you like Pensacola? Yeah. Amen. Cool. But uh, but no no GPS, no no texting. Oh, how do I do this? Oh, how do I do th I see people all the time, that's all they do. I mean, they, I don't even know if they know how to talk anymore. It's like, hello, hello, hello. And they're just texting or taking pictures. I was going down the road. <laughs> I ain't going to say that. I'll stop. Uh, I'll go. Because it was something I did wrong. So I, I don't want to say too much about that. Uh, then y'all have information about me. I took a bunch of pictures. I'll tell it anyways. I took a bunch of pictures while I was out in going through the Rocky Mountains. And somebody looked at him and said, did you take those while you were driving down the road? And I'm like, yeah. 99% of the wrecks happen with people taking pictures as they're going down the road. I'm like, I'm glad I'm the 1% club. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No compass, no GPS, no cell phone to get directions, no to call for help, no texting. How in the world does the Lord expect Hagar to survive? I mean, she has absolutely no community. You know what's wrong with us? I'm telling you, brother, this thing right here will eat your lunch. You know why we don't have fellowship with God? Because we have this thing, and, and every answer we think we got is right here. Somebody else is going to give it to me. I don't need the thing. Now, I get people mad at me because I don't answer the phone. I don't like that thing at all. I don't like it. If you want me, my house is 131 Grange Hall. Come over there. If I'm there, if you see my car there, stop. I'll talk to you. Maybe. Uh, if, if you want me, you can find me. Call Mike. He might know where I'm at. Uh, call Beth. She could probably tell you where I'm at. But I'm not, I'll tell you what, this thing right here has dictated, but, but i got to have this to make money. You didn't used to. I mean, used to be able to make money really, really well. But somehow we've got in our mind, they told us, and now I'm telling you, honestly, honestly, I know we can't survive without it because there's just, the Lord cannot get to us. He can't do it. He can't do it uh, without that thing. He just can't do it. I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, he uses Verizon or AT&T and probably whatever the other ones are, uh, the cheaper ones. He, he likes, if you're going to use one, use a cheap one so you can save money and give it to the church. I, Brother, what is that, man? I mean, why? Abraham, here's Hagar out in the middle of the desert. You ever been over there in the desert? I went down through the Suez Canal on the USS Scott, and the uh, Coral Sea was out, in, not the Coral Sea, the Saratoga was out in front of us. And you're talking about an aircraft carrier, it just about filled that whole Suez Canal up. They had some room on both sides, but the carrier, you make one mistake, and you, you're going to lock that thing up. But, so I go down through. One side is Egypt, and you got little things on the shoreline there, but, I mean, it's a desert pretty much. Far as, but there's some greenery on this side. The other side is Saudi Arabia. We're talking the only thing that separates this side from that side is the Suez Canal. And it's not that wide. A carrier sideways would probably lock in there, and that's 1,100 feet long. So it would probably lock from side to side. Nothing but sand as far as you can see. I mean, hot, blistering sand. So now you imagine the Lord sitting down there, and he separates. Well, we were kind of hard on those Jews, man. They come across the Hebrews, coming across the Red Sea going out into the, the desert of sin, and they get out there, and there's no water, there's no nothing to heat all day long. I, I can see him belly aching, but again, it gets to the place where you got to trust God. Uh, Hagar is in that. She's coming down from where Abraham was, and she's starting to get into that stuff, and she's just running around in circles out there. She has no idea where she's going. 
uh, unless she knows how to navigate a desert, deserts can mess you up. They say if you walk, if you're left-handed or right-handed, uh, your one leg is just a hair longer than the other, you'll just do circles. And depending on how far your legs are off, you'll do a bigger circle or a narrower circle. And you'll just stay out there going circles until you fry. That's just exactly what you'll do. Uh, she gets out there, has no, nothing to do, no drinking, no water, runs out of water after about 48, 50 hours, whatever. Her son is about ready to die. She doesn't want to see that. She doesn't have the faith that Abraham had. Abraham trusted God. It still hurt him. I bet you for the 48 hours, Abraham was sitting there probably saying, I wonder where she's at. I wonder where Ishmael's at. Lord, I wonder if, if they're okay. I wonder if they're okay. Are they okay, Lord? Do you think they're okay? Are you still going to take You said you'd take care of them. Are you going to take care of them? I bet you Abraham was praying the whole time. Verse 15, and the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat, uh, set her down over against a, a good way off, as it were, a bow shot. Uh, any hunter will tell you a good bow shot's 40, 50 yards. So you're looking about 100 feet away. Uh, for she said, let me not see the death of her child, of the child. And she sat over against uh, him and lifted up her voice and wept. Uh, I, like I said, a, a bow shot's good 40 yards maybe. Uh, you're going to get 100, 120 feet. Uh, Hagar, Hagar was directed... Uh, to the very spot she was by the hand of God. The Lord knew. She didn't have to know anything. All she had to do was walk. You know what we do sometimes? We think we need to know. You don't need to know anything. I need to know what I'm going to do in the future. No, you don't. All you got to do is wake up today and do what you're supposed to do today. And when the door opens up today, you do what's in front of you today. And the Lord, you know, I didn't know I was going in the Navy for until 15 seconds before I went in the Navy. I tried to get in the Navy three times, couldn't do it. I did not, I could take you to the red light today. I did not know I was going to go into the Navy till I sit at that red light. And I, however long a red light is, if a red light's 30 seconds, 50 seconds, a minute, however long that red light is, is how long it took me to go into the Navy. I did not know before that red light, the red light before that red light, I had no idea I was going in the Navy. Uh, I never made it to the red light after that because when I got to that red light, I'm sitting there arguing with God when I look over and see that Navy trailer sitting in that, in that parking lot. And, I mean, my heart's desire when I see Navy, Navy. I mean, yeah, I could go in the Navy, man, right? I, mean, I can't go in the Navy. They won't take me because of my finger. Yes, go over there and join it for the Navy. They won't take me because my finger's messed up right there. See, look, they won't take me. And I'm arguing with myself. I didn't know it was the Lord until years later down the road. Then I realized who that was. You don't necessarily, that changed my entire life. That one minute at a red light in Louisville, Kentucky changed my entire life. How could you possibly know where to go? How could you do that? We can't do it, but we try it and it don't work. How's that working for you today? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm learning to shut up, man. Just sit back and wait till something happens. I got plenty of stuff to keep me busy until the Lord shows me what to do. Uh, all I got to do is do what's in front of me. I, I come over here, I put a new water heater in. Stupid things leaking back there. So the water heater we had out in the garage that I got at the bid site was bad to start with. That's why I was probably at the bid, bid site. But I got another one. We'll put that one in. Uh, and then when I get done with that, we'll do this. And when I get done with that, and maybe the Lord will show us exactly what to do. You don't have to know what to do every moment of your life. Ask any old preacher. Brother Combs, do you know what to do 24-7? Most of the time what you'll do is you'll do what God will set you down a path and he'll just say walk. And when you run out of water, I'll be there. Don't worry about it. I'll be there when you need me, but right now you don't need me, so I'm going to watch you and let you learn some things. And you just learn and learn and learn, and then you realize, hey, this is going to hurt. Somehow it's going to hurt. I don't know why it's going to hurt, but I'm going to set him over because I don't want to watch this thing happen to my son. If God tells you something and you do it, I'm going I'm to preface this, but you better make sure he told you to do it. I personally think, that's between me and the Lord, and when I get to heaven, I'll find that 100% for sure. But I personally think that he told me to go into the Navy. I don't have a problem. I think he told me to marry Bethany. I, told, I think he told me to wait till I was 49 years old, and when I got to where I was supposed to be, we started this church. Uh, there's young guys out there who want to start a church at 22, 23. Go for it, man. Have at it. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that goes in behind starting something and doing something for God that uh, just don't happen overnight. Now, you can go out and beat your head against the wall. wall. I got a friend I'm trying to get up here to do a, uh, a revival with us in maybe February, somewhere between February and April time frame, and then we'll have Dr. Peacock come in. I told him, I was talking to him yesterday, 
And I said, hey, brother, I said, the reason I want you all in here is maybe you all can fire us up a little bit to get us up to where when Dr. Peacock comes in, we're ready to go, and we're all running the aisles and screaming and hooping and hollering. He started laughing. And I talked to him. And the two men that I'm going to try to get in, one of them had a church, and, and he left the church for a reason. And, and this other young man took the church. And after a while, he let the church go, and he goes, I am not a pastor. I said, brother, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard anybody say. <laughs> I mean, to do that, sometimes it, it better be God calling you to do that because you're going to have to put up with stuff that you just don't. God's going to tell you sometimes, Lord's going to tell you to do stuff that it's like nobody else is even going to be interested in this stuff. When we put this thing on right here, I knew this is what I had to do. I knew it. I knew this is what needed to be done. I, I was at that end looking this way, and I hated the way this thing looked. I just didn't like it. I couldn't stand it. Uh, every time I preached from that way to this way, I, I seen that box sitting here. I was like, ah. And I knew what the Lord said do, and I couldn't get, really generate any uh, enthusiasm about it until I sold my truck. You know what the Lord did? He let me get a, 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 gold, or a, a gray truck, a silver truck. I, I, I'll never get silver again. Every time I get silver, the Lord takes it from me and makes me spend it somewhere else. But I got that silver truck, and the Lord says, well, you got a truck? I said, yeah. He goes, well, you can sell it for 5000 I said, yeah. He goes, you can get the plans. Well, Mike did line me up with a guy who did plans for 5000 or whatever it was. And I, I sold my truck and gave the guy 5000 and I had plans. He said, why would you do that? Well, when I went to build my house over there on Grange Hall, uh, all I had was $1,000, and I knew the Lord told me to build a house. And I had people laughing at me all the way through that thing. But I knew the Lord told me to build a house. I said, I'll build a house. I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I got a thousand bucks. I got a set of plans. Rolled my plans out on the table one night. I said, Lord, there's my plans. I ain't got no money. Beth hands me an envelope. And it says, we'll give you 125% of the value of the house. The guy gave me $50,000 above what the value of my house was. We started that house. And by the time I got done with that thing, I run out of $50,000. My father-in-law come and said, Oh, you can't do that, man. Uh, I mean, Bill's 80 years old, and he's up on the roof with me the whole time. He never would leave me by myself over there. And every time I run out of money, he'd give me more money to keep going. I think he just wanted to see me get hurt. It's, it's like going to the, the uh, amusement parks or whatever. whatever. And I, so he gives me more money. Then my mom gives me some money. And then the next thing you know, within $80,000, $85,000, the house is done. And we're moving into it. And I was thinking 10 years, we're going to take me 10 years to do this. And within two years, I was in that house. And I'm sitting there going, how in the world did that happen? God said, I told you to do it. And no matter what anybody else says, doesn't matter. What did I tell you to do? But, but you know, you listen to the other prophets, you're going to get eaten by line. You understand that? You do what I tell you to do. No matter what it looks like, I don't care. You know what Hagar did? She went, Abraham had to send her out in the wilderness. Doesn't matter what it looks like. You know what it is? I told you to do that. Are you going to trust me or not? Most of your decisions in life will be made within a couple seconds of your life. Something will happen and walk in your life within that little time frame, and your life will change right there within a couple seconds. The problem is, is are you going to wait to that couple seconds? Or how much other stuff are we going to do that we got to clean up before we get to those couple seconds? Hagar, Hagar, God, verse 17, says, well, I'm going to finish my last. If God tells you something and you do it, you can take it to the bank. You can. That's my saying right there. I believe you can take it right to the bank. Uh, he, he will do what he says. We started this church. I got those plans. I'm sitting here with a set of plans in my hand and really no, not a whole lot of money to do anything with. And somebody came up and gave me 10 grand. They said, how much is it going to cost to put that footers in out here? Uh, I had a quote on it, $10,000. I said, I need 10000 They wrote me a check for 10 grand. You say, what was that? Well, as soon as I got the footers done, somebody else came up and said, hey, What's it going to talk, take to frame that thing in? I said, 10, 000, everything was $10,000. <laughs> it's just like 10. And they gave me $10,000, and we framed it in. And before long, this thing was done. And I'm sitting there going, how in the world? The Lord said, I told you to do it. I didn't have to tell everybody else. I'm going to tell them to give you the money to do it. So we're going to put a, a 80 by 20 on the back of the building. So y'all get ready. Y'all start praying so that the Lord, when he tells you to give me money, you just do it. And I'm just joking. <laughs> We'll get, <laughs> that was funny. Y'all can laugh at that. I know, I know we've had a lot to eat, but verse 17, and God heard the voice of the lad. Why? He gave Abraham the promise about his son. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a nation of your son. Didn't say anything about Hagar. He said, so God, although he listens to Hagar, he's listening to the lad now because God has vested interest in this young man. Uh, this man, this young man right here is, is in God's 
crosshairs. Uh, he shouldn't have been, but because of Abraham, he now is. And God's got him in his eyeballs. He's, got, he's not going to let him go. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of the Lord, an angel of God, called unto Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. Boy, you talking about comfort? I don't know if you've ever had, had God talk to you when you needed somebody to talk to you. But out there in the Navy, I mean, I learned a whole bunch of stuff. There. I, I think it's a, to me it was the greatest thing that could ever happen to me uh, because there was times where I knew that, that I was by myself and alone and I didn't have anything. And curl up in a rack by yourself at nighttime and just the whole world's going by and you just don't know really what's happening and everything seems to be falling apart. But, I mean, everything in my Navy career was flying like it should. I was accelerating. I was soaring, but it's just my personal life was just falling apart. And you crawl in bed, and you put a headphones on, and you throw some music on, and you throw a tape on, and you're out there by yourself, and you're just looking for something from God. There's nobody else around. You're on a ship with a thousand men, and nobody in there. You can't find a Christian anywhere on the ship, and you're sitting there just trying to get a nugget or something from the Lord. That's all you're trying to get, just to get me through for another moment, just another moment. And then all of a sudden, you realize the Lord comes in that thing and says, Hey, Mike. What about this? Hey, Mike. And the, the conversation starts going on in your head, and you're talking about peace. It's just like, don't worry about it. Everything will be okay. Everything will be okay. Just don't worry about it. It'll be okay. We sit sitting at the house yesterday, and uh, all my kids were there, and Beth was there. And I remember a day sitting on the side of the ship, I had absolutely zero nothing, nothing. And now there was four little kids running around. Well, not running around. Uh, two of them were running around. One was crawling, and the other one was thinking about crawling. Uh, and you sit there and look at it, they're all just running around and running around and running around, and the room was full of kids and uh, young people and, and my wife. And I sit there watching my wife, and I'm thinking, you know, there was a day when I didn't have her, and there's a day when I got her that she didn't think she could have them. And here they all are, and, and then they all left, and I was like, yes! <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> you, you don't have five kids <laughs> and, and three grandpuppies. But anyways, I'm telling you what, brother, you gotta, you, the Lord says, I'm going to give you desires of your heart. He's always done exactly what he said. And uh, you just got to wait for that thing sometimes. And God heard the voice of the lad. He said, fear not. Hagar, fear not. For God heard the voice of the lad where he is. And said, arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand, and I will make him a great nation. Now, this promise is now to Hagar. Hagar didn't have this promise up to this point. That promise was to Abraham. Now all of a sudden, Hagar, I'm filling you in on this thing too. We're going to take care of this kid. I will make him a great nation. And he's going to make him a great nation. Uh, he's going to, he, the kid's going to grow up, man. He's going to, uh, man, I'll tell you what, that, a lot of our mathematics, stuff like that, come out of the Arab nations. Uh, they're not a stupid people at all, not an ignorant people at all. They're very intelligent people. I've worked with a bunch of um, uh, Muslim people, and I'm telling you what, uh, with uh, Eastern uh, Middle East uh, uh, backgrounds and stuff. And, and those guys are sharp as a tack. I mean, that's just it. But their God is not our God. And, and one day the Lord's going to deal with that whole thing. I'm not even going to mess with it. Uh, you're not going to win. You're just not going to win usually. Verse 19, and God opened her eyes. You know, you get over to, go over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Well, you're talking about a Christmas present. You ever had your eyes opened? John chapter 4, there's a lady sitting here. She's by Jacob's well, verse 5. It says, now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being, oh, I like, <laughs> uh, go back to verse, man, go back to 1. Might as well just go to 1. Uh, when therefore the Lord knew how, the, uh, how uh, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though he himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Why? Well, there's a lady sitting there who needs to hear something. Uh, verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there, and, and Jesus therefore, being weary with his journey, sat, uh, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman, uh, of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou dost, uh, that thou, uh, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the, the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, 
and who it is that said to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, sir, that has nothing to draw. She still don't see yet. Uh, with, with, uh, draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the, so it's going back to Isaac, Jacob, all the way back, and uh, the children and, uh, and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto him, unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall never, uh, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, uh, him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. He opened her eyeballs up. You know what? Uh, back here, the well, she's within a bow shot of that water. And I've heard people say when you're out in a desert, you can smell water. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm, I've never really been a desert person. Uh, I've been in deserts before, but never long enough to live there. But uh, people who dwell there, they can sense it. Uh, they actually say that you can take those divining rods and, and go out and find water. And they, Old timers, I mean, that's how they used to find wells. You, you'd say, how does that work? I have no idea. Uh, but there's a, a people with, with can do stuff that uh, we have got now. Oh, you got to have a satellite 23,000 miles out and taking pictures of the earth so we know where to go. No, I tell you what, if you look, it's a big, big blue wet thing, man. It's like got water everywhere. Uh, you can go find water anywhere you want to. Hagar here, though. She opened her eyes. God opened her eyes. Uh, when you get saved, you know what the first thing the Lord does? He opens your eyes. He opens your eyes to your condition. Uh, what's wrong with a lot of people? They don't understand their condition. Her condition was, I'm lost in a desert, going in circles, and I'm dying. And my son is going to die, and everybody else around me is going to die, and we're going to die, and there's no hope. That's her condition. The Lord says, Hagar, what else are you talking about? Oh, man, <laughs> Peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Boy, all of a sudden you get that voice out of heaven. I bet she didn't worry about getting a drink anymore. She's just in there listening. Well, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, but hey, girl, what you worry? Don't worry, man. Don't worry. Just grab your son by the hand, open your eyeballs up, and look, there's a well of water right there, right next to her. You're talking about a salvation. This thing, this book has it from, from cover to cover. There's no different than the, the, the woman right here, Samaria. Go back to Genesis. Man, I got two minutes. I am learning... To shut down at 10.50. It might take me a while to learn that, but I will get it one of these days. Hagar was about 100 feet from water uh, and, was, uh, and it was about to die. You know how many, how many billion people are on this planet that are like that far away from Jesus Christ and they die and go right to hell? And he says, I'm the living water. I mean, it's... There's no excuse. I talk to people all the time. There's just no excuse for not believing. I don't understand why somebody doesn't want to believe Jesus Christ. I don't understand why they don't want to argue with him and, and, and talk to him and, and help have him, you know, beat you down a little bit and, and whoop up on you some so you can get to the place where you, he wants you to be. I don't understand that. Uh, you're going to get beat up anyways. You hear everybody, I hear people talk all the time, well, my boss takes advantage of me. And my, blah, 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 blah. my car breaks down. This happened. That happened. It just happens. Things happen in life. You do know that, right? It just happens. And there's nothing you can do about it. But if you got Jesus on your side, at least you know he's there. <laughs> now, the rest of it may fall apart. But you always say, man, one of these days the rapture's going to happen and I get out of here. <laughs> the, the other people don't have that. Notice God had to open her eyes to see the water. He had to open my eyes on a back porch in Louisville, Kentucky. It took him a while to get me there, but he had to open my eyes step by step. And one day I said, I got real thirsty, man. I got real, real thirsty. And I couldn't believe how thirsty I was. He had open my eyes to see the water of life. John, I know we mentioned, that before. go to uh, John 5, 40, and I'll stop right here. This will be the last verse. Promise, promise, promise. Well, I could be lying. But I know I'm really real. 5, 40. Jesus, he says, search the scriptures. That's from Genesis to Revelation. Search the scriptures, 39. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. You know what you need to do is come to him. Nobody else. Nobody else will work. We got a season here, and everybody likes a little baby in a manger. However, comma, the little baby can't cause you any problems. It's just a little baby. Boy, they can cry a lot. You watch a mommy when they're a little baby and see if that little baby can't cause you problems. Uh, they'll make a mommy jump all over the place, fall down, hit the ground, bust her head. And all of a sudden you think, that's what they all do. But they think, oh, that's the end of life right there. That little baby just died. 
I mean, it's all, oh, that's my baby. No, that's just, that's just what happens. Uh, Elizabeth won't let me hold her baby and if I'm holding uh, Jonathan's baby, Sarah's baby. Because when Elizabeth was little, I had Sarah on one side, Elizabeth on the other side, and I tilted over and hit the wall and went down the door and slid her head open. She had to get stitches, and she thinks I'm going to do that to her kid. So uh, she won't let me carry but one at a time. Uh, maybe it's because I'm old. But I tell you what, when you sit there and get all this stuff, the Lord says you won't come unto me, and you will not come to me, that you might have life. Life isn't just getting saved. That's just where it starts. You know what you do? You come to him and you get life. Real life is in Christ. Always been in Christ. Always be, will be in Christ. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for all these stories through the Bible, Lord. And thank you for uh, the, uh, the, the story of your birth. Lord, I know the world ce celebrates it now. And Lord, I don't know if I believe that it's this time frame, but it doesn't really matter because you were born. And, Lord, you came into the world, and, and, Lord, you opened the door, and you gave us eternal life. Thank you for opening up uh, my eyes and those around me. Lord, I pray now that you'd uh, help us to get the word out that others' eyes will get opened at the same time. Father, again, thank you for your blessings this morning. Bless the morning service, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.